welcome to Shelf Life. I'm your host, Patricia Emerson. In the background is my dog, Libby, uh, who only wishes that she could read these books. Today's episode focuses on books that are told with stories that are told by multiple narrators from different points of view. The first of these is by John Hersey. It's a classic, Hiroshima. On August 6, 1945, the United States dropped the first atom bomb in Hiroshima, Japan, in hopes of ending World War II. Hersey went back to Japan and interviewed six different people who survived the episode, the event, and one of these is Ms. Sasaki on the day of the event. Ms. Sasaki went back to her office and sat down at her desk. She was quite far from the windows, which were off to her left, and behind her were a couple of tall bookcases containing all the books of the factory library, which the personnel department had organized. Just as she turned her way, head away from the windows, the room was filled with a blinding light. She was paralyzed by fear, fixed still in her chair for a long moment. Everything fell, and Miss Sasaki lost consciousness. The ceiling dropped suddenly, and the wooden floor above collapsed in splinters, and the people up there came down, and the roof above them gave way. But principally, and first of all, the bookcases right behind her swooped forward and the contents threw her down with her left leg horribly twisted and breaking underneath her. There, in the tin factory, in the first moment of the atomic age, a human being was crushed by books. In the voices of six different survivors, John Hersey tells a classic tale. You won't want to miss it. Who Killed Christopher Goodman by Alan Wolfe is a novel told in both verse and prose and covers an event that happened when Alan was in high school in 1979. In this book, the guiding question is, what if? If we had have done something different, if each one of us had have done something different, would Chris Goodman still be alive today? It's haunted Alan Wolfe and comes out in this powerful story. This is on the day the body's discovered. And Doc Chestnut, who represents Alan's character, David Oscar Chestnut, Doc, is running with his friend Squib. Oh my God, said Squib, as he came to a sudden halt. There on the road's shoulder, a dark shape near the top of a shallow embankment, lying still on the ground. What is it, I said. It was a kid, about my own age. The air around him was thick with buzzing bottle flies. Insects crawled over his sandaled feet. Mud splattered the cuffs of his wide, bell-bottom pants. Only one kid in all of Goldsburg wore pants like that. Christopher Goodman. This is a story about a community recovering from something that changed them forever and certainly changed the teens involved. Who Killed Christopher Goodman by Alan Wolfe. Do you ever wonder if your parents would think of giving you up on a really, really bad day when you've been difficult? In this book, Unwind, by Neil Schusterman, he imagines a world where that's one of the reasons why a parent might turn over a child to the authorities to be unwound, to have their parts given to people more deserving. The other is if, in fact, you're going to be a tithe, to be a saver of other lives, or just a state kid, uh, an orphan. That's Risa. This novel is told in their three viewpoints and what happens to them when they're set free from the um, process that lies in front of them of being unwound. She purses her lips and shakes her head. You unwinds are all the same. You think that because no one loves you, then you can't love anyone. All right, then, if there's no one you love, then pick someone who needs to hear what you have to say. So everything that's in your heart, don't hold back. And when you're done, put it in the envelope and seal it. I'm not going to read it, so don't worry about that. What's the point? Are you going to mail it? Just do it and stop asking questions. Then she takes a little ceramic dinner bell and places it on the roll-top desk next to the pen and paper. Take all the time you need, and when you're done, ring the bell. Then she leaves him alone. This is one of the odd requests that is made of Connor and the other kids once they've escaped the bus that's going to take them to be unwound. The adventure is just beginning for these three in Unwind by Neil Schusterman. In Trash by Andy Mulligan, three young boys, Rat, 
Gardo, and Raphael are trash pickers and live in the worst of poverty in a country that is unnamed, but we know it's Brazil. What they wind up doing is telling their story of a day when Raphael discovers a seriously important bag in the garbage and the authorities want it back. And he has a choice. Does he give it over or does he hold on to it? It could change his and his boys' lives forever. And in doing so, making the decision to hide, he winds up changing more than he could ever have imagined. This is when he's picked up for interrogation by the police, and it's in um, Raphael's point of view. I was lifted up, and they were carrying me to the window. The man in the suit was opening it. I was held by the policeman by my ankle and my arm, and I was going toward it sideways. It was coming at me, this big, open window. I remember warm air. I remember suddenly I was out, and the hand holding my arm let go, and I was held upside down by just one ankle. I could see the filthy wall. It was like a pit, and a long way down below me, I could see a stone floor with what looked like a trash can. I was screaming so much now, and when I looked up, they were all looking down at me. Where's the bag? shouted one of them. Did you find it? All I could shout was no. Did I come close to giving in? Trash by Andy Mulligan, a book that is full of surprises and will hold you to the very end. Mariki Nijkamp has written a book that was one of the biggest uh, splashes last year. It's called This Is Where It Ends. It tells the story of a school shooting from the multiple perspectives of high school students who are involved in it. Tomas, Claire, Sil, Autumn, and Ty, the shooter himself, who his voice is never the eye point of view, but we see him through all of these different characters who are trapped in the auditorium with him at the opening of another school year. It's an imagine it's a scene that no one really in their worst in their worst nightmares wants to imagine, but it helps us understand sort of the thinking of someone who has tortured thoughts. This is from Tomas's point of view, and this is at the beginning. I'm calling from Opportunity High, Farid says, after giving our names. We've heard gunshots. He sounds so calm. The Farid I know with his steadily teasing smile has disappeared. I've never met this Farid. He articulates with care, so his Afghan accent is mispronounced. Next thing, they'll mark him as a suspect. It wouldn't be the first time. Things happen in the school, and he gets questioned, even when it doesn't concern him at all. I hate it. It's also unfair, but at least it gives me some downtime. In this scary but realistic novel, the reader comes to understand the thinking of people involved and the wondering of these characters who happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. This is where it ends. Jennifer Niven's novel, Holding Up the Universe, is told in the voice of two teens, Jack and Libby. Each one of them has their own secret. Jack's, you cannot see. But Libby's, well, she's the fattest girl in the high school. She might be the fattest girl in the world. But she has a sense of humor that won't let you forget who she is deep down inside. For Jack, however, he's struggling with lots of things, many of them things that nobody can see. Here he says, my pulse speeds up. It starts buzzing the way my phone is buzzing. I'm thinking, you don't know me. You don't know me. Like I have some power over her mind and whatever happened, she cannot find out I was there that day. She was rescued from her house. If she does find out, she might think I'm making fun of her because I saw her being rescued from her house. That is, this is why I grabbed her. Jack has secrets he's keeping. Libby's just trying to be open and up front with what she's dealing with on a daily basis. Between the two of them, 
these unlikely teens, they form an incredible partnership that is worth reading about. Thanks for joining me for this edition of Shelf Life. Look forward to seeing you next time when we'll talk about other great books that are out there for us to read. See you then. Mm-hmm.